this was not inevitable. This was a policy choice. And even in the 1960s, people were saying this is a bad idea. And so that to me was a very compelling, like kind of find as a reporter to like be able to document, like this is not a new idea. There were freeway fighters in the 1960s. The idea of highway removal has been around since then. It's not a kind of newfangled hippie urbanist idea. Highway removal goes parallel with highway construction. Like people have been fighting highways since they were built. And so I, it was really like rewarding for me to be able to tell a kind of longer historical story. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Town channel. My name is John Summerman, and that is Megan Kimball, author of the new book, City Limits infrastructure, inequality, and the future of America's highways uh, available now. So let's get right to it with Megan. Megan Kimball, it's so wonderful to have you on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So Megan, I'd love to give my guests just an opportunity to introduce themselves. So who is Megan? Yeah. Hi, I am a freelance journalist. I live in Austin, Texas, and I'm the author of a new book called City Limits, Infrastructure, Inequality, and the Future of America's Highways. I love it. I love it. And boom, just like that. Here's your book. <laughs> so Megan, we are recording this on uh, March 26th, uh, but this is going live real soon. When does this, uh, when does the book drop? The book publishes actually a week from today on Tuesday, April 2nd. Yeah, really. yeah. And through the magic of editing and everything, you all are watching this and listening this the day after publications because you're getting this on April 3rd. And we are so excited to share with you uh, this, this book. This is an exciting book. This is an important book. Many of you know that I do have my own bookshop.org page, which is right here. And we do have the book uh, on here. So right there, first book on the list right next to uh, Peter Norton's uh, f uh, Fighting Traffic and Otanorama. So, uh, and it, for those of you who don't know, if you pur purchase a book through book bookshop.org, you can also identify your local bookstore to be able to receive a donation. And so that's one of the great things that is uh, super cool about bookshop.org. It, it helps some of those local independent bookshops uh, right there in your area. So whenever I bring on an author, I love bringing their book into the, the Active Towns uh, Bookshop and doing what we can to give some love to some of those independent bookstores. So with all that commercial out of the way, I'm just super stoked about this book. And, and I mentioned to you this, uh, mentioned this to you over an email exchange that is so fun to read a book where you're like, oh, I know that person. I know that person. That's a colleague. That's a friend. <laughs> It's a lot of fun. Was it as much fun for you to write in the sense that you're now living here in Austin and you probably run into a lot of these people out and about? Yeah, you know, I certainly didn't know them before I started reporting this book, but it what has been, I mean, this book is personal to me. I live a mile from I-35. I drove on it every day for several years before the pandemic when I heard it was going to be expanded, you know, I, I, my first reaction was not as a journalist. It was as like an Austinite. So, but now, yeah, indeed, I started reporting this in 2020. So I've spent nearly four years, you know, covering these highways. And I now know a lot of these people pretty well. You know, kind of funny thing about writing a book is you sort of knock on someone's door and say, hey, can I follow you around for a couple of years? And this might become a book a couple of years after that. And, you know, I'm always surprised by the generosity of people who say, yeah, sure. Yeah. And I can relate as a, as a content creator, as a, as a, a videographer and, and uh, somebody who, who points a camera in people's face and say, you know, hey, share your story, et cetera. Um, I, you, know, you never know what's going to come of, of that little interview, that little conversation that you're having and all of that. I can remember back almost a decade ago to very, my very first uh, conversation that I had uh, up in the Dallas area really, you know, getting to understand about I-345 and, you know, the, the, the situation that was going on up in there and met with Patrick Kennedy uh, again about a decade ago. And, uh, and that was after we just moved here to Austin. And so it was, you know, I was you know, just trying to get my bearings on, on what it's like to live here. But then 
I guess one of the good things that we should probably do right up front is talk a little bit about the premise of the book, because there's a story mentioned I-35, I just mentioned I-345, and then there's another uh, I, (laughs) interstate highway, involved there in I-45. Talk a little bit about the the structure of the book, the premise of the book, and and really the, the main characters of the book of, you know, these three main locations. And then we've got some sub characters and some sub themes that come out. Yeah. So the premise of the book is basically building highways through the middle of cities was a bad idea. Um, And, you know, the book kind of starts with the beginning of the automotive era, looking at how automobiles being, you know, took over American cities. Um, And then in 1956, President Eisenhower passed the Interstate Highway Act. And there was a big fight, you know, in the years following that around where should these highways be routed. So I went to the Eisenhower Presidential Library and kind of looked into that. Um, And it turned out, you know, even in the 1960s, planners said, hey, we should not put highways through the middle of cities. That's this legislative report that Congress looked into in terms of the routing of highways through cities. So it goes into the history of not just the interstate highway program nationally, but also in cities, you know, Dallas, Austin, and Houston, cars were pouring onto city streets and highway departments basically accommodated them by building highways right through the middle of existing neighborhoods and next to downtowns. So the book basically traces the history of how did these highways come to be? How did they come to be running through our cities to begin with? And then looking today, you know, fast forward 70 years, most of these highways are coming to the end of their productive lifespans. They need repairs, they're cracking, they're falling apart. And mostly state DOTs, including TxDOT, are responding to that by widening those highways. They're going to rebuild them, but they're going to make them bigger. And so in every city in Texas, there's a sort of grassroots opposition to that idea saying actually wider doesn't work. Um, You know, it's well understood that when you widen a highway, cars fill up the additional lanes. Um, And so I think there's a kind of a growing resistance to that form of development. So the book kind of looks at the freeway revolts of the 1960s and then kind of the premise is there's a new wave of freeway revolts today that is really trying to stop this machine of ever wider, wider highways. Yeah. yeah. And I think you sort of alluded to it uh, earlier there in terms of this wasn't necessarily your area of expertise and areas where you were like engaged with and involved with necessarily. You were just like, you were on I-35 and you're like, wait a minute, what? We're doing what? And, and, and then you dug in and you fell down the rabbit hole. Welcome to our world where we've been fighting freeways for some time and, and car dependency. I've been on this fight for the better part of about 15 years, but it must have been like a real head scratcher for you as you're like digging deeper and you're like understanding the expansion of the interstate highway system and, and really the, the, essence and the genesis of what Eisenhower was planning to do and trying to do with the interstate highway system. And then, uh, and then along comes, you know, they commissioned a report, there's this interim report and some of the details talk a little bit about how shocked he was to learn about what was actually happening. Yeah, I mean, the basic question driving my book is a very simple one that it took me a, a book to figure out is like widening highways does not fix traffic. Why are we still widening highways? And as it turns out, like even in the 1960s, even at the conception of the Interstate Highway Program, people were saying widening highways does not fix urban congestion. So um, the Interstate Highway, this was like one of my favorite reporting finds. I went to the Eisenhower Presidential Library, which is where this photo is from. And I spent three days, you know, looking through the archives Eisenhower tasked this man, John Bragdon, as to implement, basically oversee the implementation of the Interstate Highway Program. And so Interstate Program was running over budget. It was running $11 billion over budget, the $25 billion program. That's a significant chunk of money, largely because states were choosing to build highways through cities. And so this guy Bragdon basically asked Congress to look into it, to say, did you mean for this to happen? Was this your intent in writing, passing this law. And so that question led to this report, legislative intent with regard to like interstate routes in urban areas. And what it found was, no, Congress did not intend for the interstate highway program to be 
the money enabled by that program to be to to be used to be solve urban urban congestion. The intent of the program was one of national defense. Let's connect America's cities in case of a nuclear attack, and let's enable economic prosperity by allowing good and travel between those cities. At no point was it intended to solve urban congestion, and so. Bragdon found this. He presented to Eisenhower, like I think someone in the kind of urbanism world famous meeting. But all I really knew before I went to the library was like Eisenhower was unhappy with that presentation. But I actually found the text of Bragdon's presentation to Eisenhower, everything that he said to him. And he laid out basically like all of the track. You know, he's an engineer. He's a Republican. This is just a matter of simple geometry that. Right. Cars take up more space than people. And so he told Eisenhower, he was like, you know, everyone, all the experts say the way to solve urban congestion is not through highways, it's through transit. That is what we should be funding with that money. Instead, states are taking, you know, taking advantage of this 90-10 provision that the federal government is going to pay most of interstate highways and they're building highways through their cities and wasting our money. I mean, it was really a financial issue. And Eisenhower was frustrated. He said this was not the intent, his intent, and people who had implemented the program that way had to done it against his wishes. Yeah. And then the, that brings us, as you said, <laughs> around to where we are at these days and the way that that has really kind of manifested itself is in these challenges um, that we have in these three starring cities here in Texas, in uh, Dallas, uh, Austin and, and Houston. We'll, we'll start here, um, you know, with the the the. The interstate that's closest to both of us here in in Austin in I thirty five, and and we'll flip through. We've got we've got um, Houston next to in I forty five, and then finally Dallas in I three three forty five. But starting with Austin in I thirty five, talk a little bit about this because this was the genesis of sort of you the spark of you digging into this and understanding this a little bit more. What did you find out when you started to dig into the history of I-35? Yeah, a lot of people who live in Austin might know that I-35 was built along what was formerly East Avenue. So it was this like wide boulevard with a big grassy median in the middle. Families used to picnic there. You know, there's a great video, I think, from 1943 that the Chamber of Commerce did that shows it. There's like literally children playing in the middle of the street. In the 1928 comprehensive plan that Austin passed, East Avenue was the segregating street in Austin. So Black families were not allowed to live uh, west of East Avenue. They were concentrated into a six square mile, quote unquote, Negro district. Uh, Well, fast forward 20 years when the Texas Highway Department was building, you know, highways across the state, they chose East Avenue as the place to route a highway through Austin. So they built this, you know, massive structure through the heart of the city. And I've talked to elders in East Austin who said, you know, it was this wall. You don't go on the other side of I-35. You know, even after segregation was outlawed, uh, it remained sort of de facto segregated. So it was this highway that has long segregated Austin. It's in 1974, um, Texas Highway Department made this double-decker highway. So it truly is like this kind of wall. It's like very imposing. You know, you can see it from blocks away. It's really hard to bike or walk around it um, or under it. And so it's very much a kind of a, a dividing line in Austin. Yeah. yeah. And and it really was a, a segregating dividing line between, you know, what was then, you know, considered white Austin and uh, the black and brown, uh, you know, populations. And, and, and we see over on the east side, you know, the legacy of that for sure. But really what ends up kind of happening, I think, in as your book sort of unfolds and what we've been living through in, you know, this prospect of I-35 being rebuilt is this tension that exists, you know, with that legacy of a segregating past. And, and so there's some themes that sort of boil up in the narrative of your book, um, which is actually kind of related to these three points that you have, um, you know, identified here on the map in the Escuelita del Ama, La Vista de Lopez, as well as the community land trust home. 
talk a little bit about that relevance of of these three points on this map, because that's kind of the the most people who who hear about oh yeah oh, they're going to be okay they're going to rebuild I thirty five okay yeah whatever it's going to be pricey oh wow that's yeah okay okay whatever they got the money right okay all right yeah whatever but really there's there's an impact that's associated with this talk talk a little bit about or a little more about that yeah there's enormous impact so. I sort of started reporting this when I learned about this massive expansion of I-35 through Austin, which, you know, has been in the works for almost 20 years and TxDOT finally got it funded. And that, as as you'll see here, will expand the highway in some stretches from 12 to 20 lanes. So it will be a significantly larger highway. And to build a significantly larger highway, TxDOT needs to take land. And so the highway will take, I think, something like 140 acres of land. And that includes a lot of businesses and homes that are along the highway, including these three on the map. So Escuelita del Alma is a a Spanish immersion preschool right on the I-35 frontage road. They started in the early 2000s downtown and were forced to relocate after, you know, developer decided to build a a high rise hotel on their former school. Um, And then they settled in Cherrywood and have been there for, you know, I think 15 or 20 years. Um, It's this really kind of like community like, you know, parents from across the city send their their kids to the school, you know, because it's very centrally located. They can go to, maybe they work at UT or the hospital across the street. Um, and that preschool is, will be demolished for the expansion. And so the, you know, I spoke to the owners of the preschool who are really worried about finding a new home for their school. It's a sort of existential crisis for them that Austin, real uh, the real estate in Austin is so unaffordable. Preschools are not high income businesses. And I think to me that was so moving because it's not just about, you know, one person's home. Okay, one person has to move. 250 families send their children there. Their their kind of days revolve around this place. That's a huge disruption to a community. You know, and it's also like a question of what kind of future do we want to leave those children, which we can kind of come back to with regards to climate change. But the other two are uh, community land trust properties owned by a nonprofit called Guadalupe Neighborhood Development Corporation that has been building affordable housing in East Austin for several decades now. You know, as I mentioned, the segregation of Austin, well, East Austin, in part because of that, land values were really low compared to the rest of the city. And so as gentrification has come to Austin, East Austin is this huge uh, center of that. And home prices have like gone up by a factor of six over the last two decades. So this nonprofit started building affordable homes for people with generational ties to the neighborhood. And the third one, it's it's number three on the map. It's this property at 1103 Claremont. And GNDC acquired a single family property and set about building two brand new homes to, to house you know, people with generational ties to East Austin, people who would have to qualify through their income. So these are people who are typically pretty low income families. And as they were you know, about to break ground, they learned that TxDOT wanted to take that land to build a highway. So... To me, you know, the the I-35 project, so it will, it's this kind of, it's going to be a depressed highway through Austin and the city is now kind of arranging funding to build these caps over the highway. And often that is framed in language of justice as we are going to reconnect, you know, the divide, this dividing line, we're going to re-stitch Austin. And I, you know, the, the founder of GND or the executive director of GNDC is really skeptical of that because it's like justice is in kind of supporting the people who were harmed by that highway. And rather than bringing those people back to Austin, rather than supporting them and staying here, it's actually displacing people. Um, And so I'm pretty skeptical of the whole kind of cap conversation that's happening because it's, it's happening in the context of a massive highway widening that will displace among other things, a bilingual preschool and affordable housing. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a similar sort of narrative that, that happens in, in each of these, you know, cities when we look at this his, the history between I-35 and I-45 down in Houston and, and, and the same thing. You've got, you know, identified here, you know, five different uh, locations that are identified uh, on this particular map. Talk a little bit about I-45 in Houston and, you know, some of the the challenges that exist down in, in this particular area. Um, their fight 
And, and, and I guess we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the I-35 fight and the difference between Rethink 35 and Reconnect Austin and, and, and the challenges that, that exist on that. But let's, let's focus in on, on I-45 in Houston uh, just a little bit, because I think what's really beautiful about your book is how you interweave through the years, as you you could tell that you were working on this for four years, um, and and you sort of weave the story of these different locations, uh, you know, the three main stars in Dallas and Houston and, and Austin, uh, as well as the the sub characters and some of the other sub cities that are, provide context to this battle. But expand a little bit more on Houston. So this project is known locally as the I-45 project. It's actually called the North Houston Highway Improvement Project. And I mentioned that because it's enormous. It encompasses I-45, but also will rebuild Houston's downtown loop, which includes I-69 and I-10. Um, and this project, you know, it's a huge project. I think it's budgeted currently at $10 billion. And the scope of displacement is staggering. 1,200 people will lose their homes. 300 businesses will be displaced. And mostly those homes and businesses are owned or occupied by people of color. And so in 2021, one of those people, her name is Modesty Cooper, uh, filed a civil rights complaint. She's a black woman in her 30s who lives right on the I-10 frontage road. And her home is in the pathway of this highway expansion. And she saw that it would disproportionately impact people of color and filed a civil rights complaint with the federal government saying, hey, that's not right. Actually, it's not just not right. It's against the law. And other community groups filed their own civil rights complaints. And as a result, the federal government actually paused this project in the spring of 2021, which was kind of unprecedented. It was a really remarkable move while they investigated these civil rights complaints. So a lot of the book sort of chronicles the fight to really to stop this highway and the main group fighting it is called appropriately Stop Text on I-45. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's skip over to Dallas and then we'll come back. Don't worry. We'll come back to, to Houston because there's a lot more to talk about. We're also going to pull up the uh, um, uh, the websites to, to each of these uh, different groups uh, within each of these cities. But let's give an overview to, to what the I- uh, 345 fight is all about in Dallas. Yeah. So this one is actually kind of a fun, exciting, positive fight. So um, an urban planner in Dallas named Patrick Kennedy, uh, you know, moved to Dallas, started walking under I-345, which is this elevated highway that bounds the eastern edge of downtown Dallas and saw that it was kind of falling apart and wondered, you know, like, why is it here? Couldn't it be something better? And so he started this campaign for the removal of I-345, which connects I-75 with I-45. You can see there in that map. So he basically started this sort of citywide conversation looking at the removal of this stretch of highway. He and others calculated that removing it would free up or kind of you know, it's surrounded by like surface parking lots. It's like not highest, best use of this land that's right in downtown Dallas. And so he calculated that removing that highway would free up 377 acres of land, which on which you could put a lot of housing and jobs. And so there's been this sort of conversation in Dallas over the last five years and TxDOT actually studied removing I-345. I guess I won't tell you what happened with that, or I won't tell listeners what happened with that fight, but... Um, it's kind of remarkable. I think, you know, there's a there's a national conversation about highway removal. And I found it to be pretty inspiring that that is happening here in Texas, this very auto centric state. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's funny, too, because I, I have some personal experience with uh, with the Dallas situation. And uh, I had the opportunity to attend the the Congress for New Urbanism. Uh, annual gathering uh, when it was in Dallas. And so I, I tend to, to lead fun runs at the, the annual gathering of the Congress for New Urbanism. And uh, one of the, the routes that I planned went right through Deep Ellum and went right underneath the 345 uh, area. So I'm like, as I'm reading this, I'm going, yep, I re we ran right through here. <laughs> and we saw, you know, we paused, we actually paused and talked a little bit about what that was like, you know, and how the legacy of these freeways that were ripped through the interstates that were ripped through the middle of these cities and 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 how that negatively impacted so many of these cities. And it's not just these three Texas cities, as 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 you point out in the book, there's a there's a a, a history and a long legacy that 
you know, wasn't intended by the original Eisenhower plan, which was really, again, for troop movement and being able to, you know, from a national defense perspective, they didn't expect it to, to ream out the middle of viable neighborhoods. And, um, and it's much more insidious than, than all of that. It, it, it ripped through oftentimes uh, neighborhoods, which were neighborhoods of color. And so uh, you mentioned a little bit there, at the very end about this is part of a national fight. And, and I mentioned Congress for new urbanism. And in fact, the Congress for the new urbanism has uh, a freeways without futures uh, page that they do or report that they do every two years. And so that's what we're looking at here on screen now. And when you go back, it's, it dates back to 2008 was the very first year that they put the report together. And again, every two years they on typically it's, right around every two years that they do that. Um, they, they come up with, you know, their list. It's not quite a top 10 list. Sometimes it's more than 10. Um, talk a little bit about the revelation that you had when you discovered that, oh, wait, there's like an organization that's like been following this for the better part of a couple decades and producing a report about freeways without futures. And oftentimes these freeways without futures are, in alignment with some of these challenges that you're documenting within these three core cities of, in part of the narrative of your book. Yeah, I found these the Freeways Without Features report through my conversations with Patrick and Dallas about I-345. I think what was kind of revelatory to me discovering this was that almost every city has a highway tearing through it that like something needs to be done with it. And in lots of cities across the country, there are people saying, hey, let's get rid of it. You know, that this is not supporting our city. It's not generating prosperity. It's polluting our air. Let's get rid of it. Um, and so that, you know, this Dallas example was, does not exist in isolation. It's very much part of a national movement. Yeah. And I sort of fast forwarded to uh, the report that was produced in 2012 uh, to the inner loop in Rochester, which you highlight in the book as, you know, an area that is in, in, in transition. It's actually in the process of a it's a it's a positive story in the sense that. Part of it has been removed and filled in. Um, it was, a, again, one of those ditches of, of a freeway creating a moat, cutting off uh, neighborhoods. Uh, but then there's a, an additional portion of the of the inner loop that uh, they're they're looking at and they're they're trying to be intentional about how the way that they do that. Because as you mentioned in the book and as you mentioned earlier, there's some challenges to like removing these these barriers, these physical manifestations of segregation and, and separation. We have to be kind of careful and intentional about doing it in a way that is going to be really positive and representative of uh, the, the people who were affected in the past, as well as the people who are there now. Yeah. I mean, I talked to, so in, as you said, that Rochester's now, they tore down their inner loop East and they're now considering tearing down the, or filling in rather the inner loop North, which stretches, you know, kind of on the Northern edge of downtown. And that highway was originally built through a neighborhood called Market View Heights, which, you know, at the time was like kind of a mixed race, low income neighborhood. Um, and I talked to two, you know, kind of older men who remember when that highway was built, they remember what was there and they remember what was demolished to build it. And they are, you know, I met them at this kind of uh, event talking about the Interloop North removal, like what does the community want to do with that land? What could be done? How could it restitch Rochester? And they are very skeptical that anything will change. And I, you know, it really struck me talking to them that like, you know, in the 1960s, planners came along and said, hey, we have a great idea to build prosperity for your city. We're gonna build this highway. And fast forward 70 years, planners are coming along and saying, hey, we have a great idea to build prosperity in the city. We're gonna remove this highway. I think people are understandably pretty skeptical of that idea that this kind of top-down approach to urban planning that doesn't maybe take into what a community wants for itself. And that community is very distinct in the sense of lots of people live there now who still live there now who were impacted when that highway was created so i think the kind of how you do it better is to just like it, it takes longer and it's much more complicated to do like real community engagement i think it's possible I, I wrote a story for the new york times about the 11th street bridge park 
in Washington, D.C., which is kind of the vision is to build a park on an old highway bridge spanning the Anacostia River. And that project has been in the works for a decade and they have not broken ground. What they have done instead is build a lot of affordable housing, support small small businesses, engage with the community about what they really want. And so it's much more expensive um, and it takes a long time, but I think it's certainly possible to do it differently. Yeah. And one of the sub themes, I'm going to pop on over here to Rethink 35, uh, their website, but one of the sub themes that is uh, apparent in each of these locations as well as some of the side examples like Rochester is what you just mentioned, which is, you know, housing and affordable housing. And the fact that, you know, for those of us who are urbanists, we understand that there's no way that we can talk about housing and affordable housing and the housing challenge without also taking into consideration land use planning and, and the connection to transportation and the challenges of transportation and, Basically, what we've done in the United States is since we went whole hog into car dependency and we teased apart our meaningful destinations from where we live and where we go to school and where we recreate, it's we've we've made it almost owning a car almost being the 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 baseline, you know, the the ante to even being in, in the game. And so it's really, really interesting when we're when we're trying to, like, unwind things and decouple things and and put a stop to this it's like oh yeah but it's not just as simple as tearing this down uh like in the example that in 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 the case of of dallas it's like well wait a minute i'm on the far south side and i need i-345 to be able to get to my job in the far north side again so it's it's not as simple as just oh if we tear this down everything will be repaired and everything will be hunky dory it's way more complicated than that uh, but to your point about community engagement that's where we're at now with, with what's on screen i35 rethink 35 is a community engagement uh, group. Talk a little bit about this group. They're, they're a group of, of good friends of mine that I've highlighted here on the channel several times, uh, but I, I'd love to hear your orientation and how you got connected with them. Yeah, so Rethink 35 is this group that's basically advocating not just not expanding I-35, but actually t- removing it and turning it into a boulevard and rerouting interstate traffic on SH-130, which goes to the east of Austin. And so Adam Greenfield is the founder of the group. He basically kind of put forth this idea in early 2021 after the I-35 expansion was already funded. He's great. He's British. And, he, you know, grew, I talked to him about kind of how he got involved in all this. And he grew up on, you know, an island in the, um, off the coast of, of uh, Great Britain and talked about how, you know, he didn't grow up around highways. So when he moved to a place like Texas, he could see that they are not inevitable, that they are very much a policy choice. And so this group is, yes, has been around for a couple of years now. And they're really, you know, they've canvassed neighborhoods adjacent to the highway to try to get people more involved. So you, I'm sure, you know, uh, Reconnect Austin has been around for like almost 20. Sinclair Black has been kind of beating the drum of Reconnect Austin for 20 years. And their vision is to kind of is to basically tunnel I-35 to narrow it up substantially and cover it with a, a cap like they've done in Dallas, um, but much bigger spanning you know, the entire length of Austin's core. And I think that's a very compelling vision. I think it's a great vision. I think, you know, I've talked to Hayden Blackwalker, who's now kind of uh, taken over for Sinclair. That vision is itself a compromise, recognizing that TxDOT is not going to remove the highway. You know, this is not an agency that is, I think, even willing to consider that idea. But I think they, you know, I've kind of watched as, as Reconnect Austin and Rethink 35 have interacted and kind of built, you know, I see Rethink 35 is really shifting the window of what is possible, like shifting the Overton window, so to speak, around like, what can people conceive of for I-35? It's not just, do we want it wider? Do we want it the same? It's like, it could be something completely different. Like, let's talk about that. Let's talk about what do we want as a vision for the city. And so there is a kind of moral clarity around particularly climate change with the Rethink 35 vision, which is to say like transportation is the leading contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. TxDOT itself acknowledges that expanding this highway will add a lot more greenhouse gas emissions to Austin. If, you know, we all lived through people, those of us who live in Austin lived through last summer, the hottest on record, it was punishing. And during that punishing summer, TxDOT approved 
you know, issued the final, the record of decision for the I-35 expansion, committing us to more greenhouse gas emissions from our cars. And so that to me, that's like one of the things that got me really interested and involved in this is like, from a climate perspective, widening that highway will be catastrophic. And I think Rethink 35 has really leaned into that messaging. Yeah. And as you mentioned, you know, Reconnect Austin has been something that's been brewing for a long period of time, a couple decades. Uh, and whereas, you know, Adam's group in terms of, you know, Rethink 35 is relatively new in, in, in the sense that it, it really sort of bubbled up through his frustration of, wait a minute, we've got, you know, we've got SH, you know, 130 that loops right around that's an, a, a legitimate underused asset from the state of, uh, of Texas that could be done. It's yes, it's currently a toll road out there, but it, it's literally something that could be, you know, converted over to and, and be able to use. And so rethinking this concept of, hey, you know, let's rip a, uh, an interstate right through the middle of a city, a downtown non nonetheless. Uh, we could do something. And so what I love about the Rethink uh, team and the group and the community is we're seeing just this vibrancy of a, of a younger group of activists. And so it's like a whole new generation, including students at, at UT and, and, and beyond. Um, and so I, I kind of like, as an older guy, I kind of like, oh, I, th this group is cool. I mean, a bunch of younger, uh, a younger generation, they're looking at it in a different way. It's actually going to be their legacy, you know, or this, this is going to be a legacy that they end up inheriting if, you know, this goes through. And so uh, really, really super cool to see, you know, that youth and that energy that, you know, is part of the Rethink 35 movement. And that's also true in Houston. Stop Text I-45 is the grassroots group there opposing the I-45 expansion. And they are a really, a similarly young group. Um, a lot of people are in their 20s and early 30s. I mean, it's definitely gener cross-generational, but a lot of the volunteers and kind of people driving that are young people. And that also very much struck me is like, these people could be doing anything with their, you know, their weekends and they're out knocking on doors across Houston in the sweltering heat, asking people to get involved to stop this highway expansion. And I think, yeah, there's a lot of like young energy, which is to me kind of, it was very compelling. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to give some love also to the, the folks with the Remove I-35 uh, group, the community group. This is a coalition you know, for a, a new Dallas and, and they're also, you know, a very much a part of this. Uh, talk a little bit about the community engagement up there in Dallas and, you know, the challenge that they have uh, with I-345. Yeah, so Patrick helped found Coalition for New Dallas, Patrick Kennedy with, you know, other people that now exists like very much independent of him. And they have for years been beating the drama of removing I-345 and putting something else there. Um, and I think it's pretty, you know, they, I actually don't know if I can really speak to their community engagement. I think what they did very effectively is getting the people in power in Dallas to pay attention to this issue. So city council members, people in the North Central Texas Council of Governments, and that, you know, advocacy ultimately got TxDOT to consider removing I-345 as like a formal project alternative, part of their NEPA process. And from what I could tell, that's the first time TxDOT has ever formally considered removing an interstate highway um, as like a project alternative. So they presented this in the summer of 2021 to the public. Hey, here are five options or four options, I can't remember, for the future of I-345. And one of them was removal. Um, so I think that speaks to kind of the the way that they, the way that um, the Coalition for a New Dallas kind of lobbied for change. Yeah. I do want to pull up, uh, you know, the picture, uh, you know, from the 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 I-35 fight and uh, have to give uh, Adam a little bit of love here. He's actually been uh, featured here on the channel as uh, uh, in a costume under the moniker uh, Captain Crap Land Use. Uh, so yes, he, he looks familiar there. Uh, he, he's he's a, a fascinating dude and very, very fun to, to do work with him. But this also speaks to the, what we were just talking about is the, you know, the mobilization of the youth that has been happening in this particular fight. And it's so wonderful to see that happening. Like, I, I don't know if like anyone is, the youth are mobilizing themselves. People see these as like very existential changes to threats to their future in the sense of climate change. And like, I certainly feel that myself. Like 
uh, I think people are beginning to see that highways are fossil fuel infrastructure and that just like there have been protests against fossil fuel infrastructure for decades, like highways sort of warrant the same level of urgency and action. So that picture that you just set up um, is actually, Adam was speaking in that moment, but it was like a statewide protest. So people, like a coordinated protest from groups, groups across the state came together in front of the Texas Transportation Commission in Austin to you know, lobby for change. And I thought that was pretty remarkable too, in the sense of the kind of maturity of the movement. People in different cities are talking to each other and coordinating, uh, you know, actions. Whereas I think even only five years ago, you know, if you were in Austin, you were working on I-35, but you weren't necessarily working on other projects. Yeah. We have a a few uh, photos here of, you know, some of the impacts and some of the engagement. Talk a little bit about uh, this particular photo. Yeah, so this is in Houston. It's outside the building behind the uh, that group is called Lofts at the Ballpark. And this is, I can't remember the exact number, hundreds of units of housing right on a transit line near downtown Houston, right in east of downtown. And that one of the buildings, the front, it's three buildings. The front one is in the footprint of the expansion. And so Textile bought these buildings and I think in 2020. Um, and we're moving forward with hustling tenants out of them and kind of, pay, you know, we're going to demolish them to build this highway, which is all, you know, well and good there. They certainly have the authority to do that. But then, as I mentioned earlier, this project was paused by the federal government while they investigated civil rights concerns. And the FHWA was clear, like, no action can be taken on this project. Well, TxDOT moved forward with demolishing the front building. Um, and in fact, they had plans to demolish all three buildings, which back to are actually not in the footprint of the highway expansion. And so Stop TxDOT I-45 like figured this out in part because one of the volunteers, a guy named Michael Moritz, like just goes by lots at the ballpark on his daily commute on the light rail. He looked out his window and he thought, hey, there's construction fencing up, like what's going on? Um, and they found out that TxDOT intended to demolish all three buildings when in the environmental impact statement, TxDOT had only accounted for one of the buildings. So it was going to demolish more housing than it said it would. And so they staged this protest like within a week, like they put the South TxDOT uh, crew kind of pulled this together very quickly and like marched right through East downtown in fr- with this giant banner um, in front of the lots at the ballpark building. And it, you know, so they kind of caused a fuss. They got they called their elected officials. And as a result, TxDOT did not demolish those back two buildings. And they are currently, I don't know the status, but in conversations around like converting them to affordable housing or for people emerging, you know, coming out of homelessness. So, I, you know, it's like a pretty remarkable example of organizing works. And 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 actually double checking things and holding TxDOT accountable, holding powers that be accountable. It's like. Don't just assume they're going to do the right thing. You know, I mean, to TxDOT's credit, you you mentioned this in the book. It's like, yeah, they bought the entire property. They could technically do with it whatever they wished to do with it. But at the same time, it wasn't in the environmental impact study. You know, when they identified the number of housing units lost, they only identified the front building, even though they were going to demolish the two additional buildings. So. Yeah. Spo- okay. Spoiler alert, folks. Ah, that just got me. I was like, no, <laughs> you can't just trust that they're going to do the, the right thing. So um, one of the other sub themes and, and stars of the uh, of your book is is in screen here in the Forest Theater. Talk a little bit about this. And this is a, a, up in Dallas. Yeah. So the Forest Theater is, a, you know, was a movie theater. It opened in the 1950s in what was kind of historically at, at the time a, a a white Jewish neighborhood. Um, But you see the kind of what's in that picture is uh, within like a decade, two highways were built through that neighborhood. This one is the South Central Expressway tore through South Dallas, demolished, I think 1400 homes. And as a result, a lot of white people left because they didn't like living next to a highway. And, you know, at the time Dallas was very segregated, there was not a lot of housing opportunity for black families. And so black families moved to the neighborhood. So it became this kind of uh, like a somewhat thriving black neighborhood. And the Forest Theater was where people went. So it was the kind of heart of the neighborhood. You know, I talked to people who would walk up there to like, it showed three movies a day. And some people went to all three because it was the only building in South Dallas that was air conditioned. It closed, I forget which year, (laughs) Um, 
But, you know, some people have tried to kind of restore it. Erica Badu temporarily kind of retained the lease to that building, was trying to make it a, a music center for South Dallas, which remains a, a you know, a low income black neighborhood um, and was trying to get it as an arts education center. And then a couple of years ago, a nonprofit um, basically took over the theater and just, you know, set about fundraising to restore it as this kind of cultural landmark for South Dallas. So that's what they're doing. It's called Forest Forward. They actually are breaking ground and I think next week, which is very exciting. Um, and they're going to kind of try to bring it back to its former glory. And part of the catalyst for that is what you can see in this picture is the South Central Expressway was renamed SM Wright Freeway and Texas is actually removing SM Wright Freeway and replacing it with a boulevard in part because it was rendered redundant when they built I-45 literally three blocks away. Um, you can actually see it in the background there. So the Forest Theater, it's like this kind of crazy like pizza shaped intersection. It's right at the like the tip of the pizza, the slice of pizza. So it's like literally you can stand in front of it and you look to your left and you look to your right and there are highways on either side of you. Well, TxDOT is part of a kind of a long, complicated story. It decided to remove this like, I think two mile stretch of SM Wright Freeway and replace it with a boulevard. Okay, there it is. So they started that several years ago and I, I would imagine it's going to open fairly soon. I sort of need to check back in on that. But as I was reporting, I kind of watched them tear this highway down. So when I first started reporting in South Dallas, it was like, you know, kind of this elevated, not quite as elevated as in, in Austin, but like this kind of elevated roadway cutting right through the middle of the community. You couldn't see on either side of it. It was hard to cross. Like you kind of had to go down a few blocks, come back around. And they have since, you know, leveled it. They've started, uh, you know, they like removed that highway. And so you can stand on one side of it and look across and see houses across the street. And I think it's like a pretty remarkable example of like, well, for one, Texas knows how to remove a highway if, if they yeah. want. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I was I was impressed by that. And and not in part of the book, too, is like you you, you captured the fact that not only do is it possible, but they even know how to do it and they even know how much it costs <laughs> to do it. <laughs> and, you know, the thing about SM right is that there wasn't that same kind of like TxDOT says they cannot move highways because of the congestion that will result. You know, all these highways that are in TxDOT's mind integral to moving cars around our cities SM Wright did not have that same kind of pressure because there was literally an interstate, you know, a few blocks away. But I think it's remarkable to see how that neighborhood has transformed as a result of the removal. And that's what's possible for every other neighborhood. Yeah. To close us out, we've got about five more minutes here. Just reflect on what this has been like for you. Yeah. I mean, I started reporting this book in part because like I didn't like having to drive everywhere I needed to go. And that is largely true in Austin. But I also was really worried about climate change and all of the emissions that are going to result from our cars. I think you just kind of flipped through this stat that uh, frankly made me almost fall out of my chair when I found it, that TxDOT is responsible for almost half a percentage of total worldwide carbon dioxide emissions. That That's not the state of Texas. That is just our transportation system in the state. And so to me, it's like there is like this fight is incredibly important. It's not just about urbanism. It's not just about like what do our cities feel like and are they equitable? It's like, do we have a livable future in Texas? Um, and so I find it, I, rem I still find it like very galvanizing. And as a reporter, I'm very like motivated to cover this stuff. I think there are not that many reporters reading environmental impact statements. So in, in some ways I sort of like loved that I had that field to myself. <laughs> like um, there's not, you know, there are, there are great reporters in, in Texas covering transportation, but there are not that many of us. So it was like very rewarding to, as you say, like you can kind of read an environmental impact statement and there's like great narrative there because Texas is promising things that it either can't deliver or um, it's doing things that it didn't say it would do. Yeah, I think like what was also really compelling to me about reporting this book was all of the archival research I did, which you can just like see this was not inevitable. This was a policy choice. And even in the 1960s, people were saying this is a bad idea. And so that to me was a very compelling like kind of find as a reporter to like be able to document like this is not a new idea. There were freeway fighters in the 1960s. 
The idea of highway removal has been around since then. It's not a kind of newfangled hippie urbanist idea. Highway removal goes parallel with highway construction. Like people have been fighting highways since they were built. And so I, it was really like rewarding for me to be able to tell a kind of longer historical story. Yeah. I'm sort of lingering on this final poll quote that you sent along because earlier we were, I was talking a little bit about the overall affordability challenge that we have in cities, you know, uh, around the nation and around the globe. And again, a, a big part of that is looking at the entire household budget. And when you see in Houston, nearly 20 percent of their household income is being used on transportation, you've got a problem. Yeah, completely. Like and what, you know, the. the Houston is almost ex as expensive to live in as New York City when you combine housing and transportation. So like where we are designing our cities is punishing for lots of people, but especially poor people. And I think that there's like this huge, like in that we talked a little bit about, you know, people in South Dallas are worried about removing the highway because it creates their access, you know, their it's their access to their jobs. But like kind of when you zoom back a little bit, like perpetuating car dependency is is punishing and, and has the greatest impact on low income people. And so like moving away from that will also help us make our cities more equitable. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well, Megan Kimball, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It has been such a joy and pleasure getting to know you a little bit better. I'm so glad that we were able to meet each other in person at the uh, Yimby Town uh, conference that was here in uh, in Austin. And folks, uh, again, available now. Uh, Pick up your copy of City Limits. Uh, it is out there. And uh, again, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been so much fun. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And be sure to pick up your own copy of City Limits, Infrastructure Inequality and the Future of America's Highways, available now at all fine bookstores, as well as at the Active Towns Bookshop. Uh, click on that link down below. Again, thank you all so much for tuning in. It means so much to me. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.